if you like don't forgive then like you have like all that anger inside you like you could like lash out like blindly because it's the right thing to do because everybody makes mistakes and and you can forgive people and if you don't forgive them like they won't be your friend then you'll and then you might lose a friend we forgive others because jesus forgave us because it would be nice because if i forgive them they should forgive me i think it's important for christians to forgive because like god wants us to treat others how we want to be treated so if we ever make a mistake or do something we know is wrong and later ask for forgiveness we'd expect or at least like for other people to forgive us and like show like they want to continue being our friends or just like someone who like gets along with each other so like this doesn't stand in the way of our friendship well good morning shoreline church it is so good to be here and welcome welcome to week two of our whole relationship sermon series where we're looking at these life practices and skills that make all of our relationships better. From marriage to friendships to relationships with coworkers to classmates if you're a student. And so we're looking at this series, and last week, if you remember, Pastor Kevin shared about the lifeblood of communication, of how important communication is for each and every one of our relationships. And this week, we're going to talk about the freedom of forgiveness. Now, forgiveness, really, the first time I think I remember really contemplating and thinking about this idea and this act of forgiveness was when I was about eight years old. So when I was about eight years old, I remember vividly my brother coming into my room, and with tears in his eyes, he said, I am sorry, please forgive me. Now, what had my brother done that warranted me to forgive him? Well, Earlier in the day, my brother took something that meant a lot to me, and it hurt me deeply. You see, two weeks prior to that, I celebrated my birthday, and for my birthday that year, I got my very own action figure. Yes, a Wild West action figure. And I love the Old West. And so I got this for my birthday. And so what I did is every day after I got this action figure, at the beginning of the day, I would pull him out and I would play with him a little bit. And then guess what I would do? We'd get ready to go to school. I'd put him back in his box. And then I would latch it up and I'd put him under my bed. And then off to school I'd go. And then I'd come home from school and I'd pull him out and have a great rest of the day, enjoying my action figure. Well, that particular day, I came home from school, excited to play with my action figure. So I went in, I under my bed, pulled out my box. Wait, something's not right here. And it was gone. My action figure was gone. Where could it have gone? And so I began this frantic search all around my yard, all around the house, and I looked around every face I could. And then I look in the backyard, and back in the corner of our backyard on our lot, I see some blue and yellow. And I'm like, what could that be? So I walk out there, and as I get closer to my horror, I see my action figure cut to pieces. And there next to my action figure is my dad's hatchet. And I have no idea what happened, but all I know is that all the king's horses and all the king's men could not put my action figure back together again. And so I picked up those pieces of my action figure. With tears in my eyes, I came in the house and I went in my bedroom, closed the door, and I just wept. A short while later, knock at the door. There's my older brother. And sure enough, for whatever reason, had possessed him that day, he decided to reenact a battle, and my action figure got the worst of the battle. And he said those words, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And so that day, as an eight-year-old, I had to make a choice. And I remember saying these words, I forgive you, brother. I forgive you, brother. Because I realize that action figures 
can be replaced. And eventually I was able to replace that action figure. But our relationships, they can't be replaced. Action figures can be replaced, but relationships cannot. Because forgiveness is essential for growing and guarding any relationship. And I learned that at eight years old, and I've been learning that and relearning that my entire life. Much like probably many of you, forgiveness. And why is forgiveness so important? Well, I think this idea of forgiveness, it's like water freely flowing into a garden. And you think about that. A garden that's well watered, it grows beautiful fruit and vegetables and flowers. And also, what does it do? With adequate amount of water, it guards from pest and disease. And guess what? Forgiveness, in the same way, freely flowing into a relationship grows and guards our relationship. And so therefore, today we're gonna talk about, we're gonna unpack forgiveness. So let's begin with a definition of forgiveness. What are we talking about forgiveness? First, it means this is to let go, to give up a debt, to pardon, to wipe the slate clean. And that's the biblical definition of forgiveness. And all throughout the New Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, we see that word forgiveness, whether it's in Hebrew in the Old Testament or Greek in the New Testament. And it all boils down to those simple, practical, clear definition. But what do we know about forgiveness? It is extremely complex. And it's challenging, isn't it? And it it, confusing oftentimes. And I think what aids to the confusion is that there are some deadly myths that are out there about forgiveness. And these myths are deadly to our relationship if we believe them. The myths like this, forgiveness is weakness. Have you ever heard that one or you thought about that? Forgiveness is weakness. And what do we know? The truth is forgiveness and forgiving someone shows a strength, a strength of character, but also a strength for that relationship, doesn't it? That's the first myth. The second myth is this. Forgiveness is letting an undeserving person win. Oh, yes. It's all about letting that undeserving person. They don't deserve to win. Well, church, what's the truth? When someone's hurt, no one wins. It's not a competition. And so forgiveness, it's not about a competition. It's about extending grace and love and mercy. How about this deadly myth? Forgiveness is condoning another bad behavior. Someone's bad behavior, and by forgiving them, we're affirming or condoning that bad behavior. And the truth is, the need to forgive someone means what? That they've wronged us. So we're not condoning, we're actually acknowledging that they've wronged us. And so forgiving them is an act that not only does it free us, but also it acknowledges their wrongness. How about this one, the last one? Forgiveness is forgetting. You ever heard that one? Well, forgive and forget, forgive and forget. The truth is, it's physiologically and neurologically impossible to forget. When we've been hurt or someone's caused pain in our life, we can't forget that. And so forgiveness is not forgetting. Okay, we have to understand the difference between the two. I mean, I still remember what my brother did to this day. So I haven't forgot, but I've forgiven. There's a difference. And so what's God's vision? That's the most important thing. What is God's vision for whole relationships when it comes to this concept of forgiveness? Well, what does he desire? And I think it's pretty clear. If you look at his word, really his whole word from beginning to end is a beautiful picture of what? His forgiveness. His forgiveness. And so I want to look at really three freedoms that as we look at God's word, three freedoms that God desires for us. And the first freedom is this, the freedom to forgive without keeping score. And so let's turn to Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. It says this, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, 
but 77 times. And some earlier translations have seven times seven. And so what's important is when we hear these words, we need to remember the cultural context at that time. And the cultural context at that time was that Jewish rabbis, the Old Testament, they would teach that three times, if someone harms you, someone causes pain in your life, someone sins against you, that you could forgive them up to three times. So the first time you forgive them, second time you forgive them, third time, and after that, it's eye for an eye. And Peter comes, so when Peter comes to Jesus, he probably the other disciples have been talking about, right? So Peter comes to Jesus, and he offers up to seven times? So that was very generous, wasn't it? Peter thought he was being really generous. And what did Jesus do? He just blew the doors off. He just basically said, there's no limits, no, no conditions. And why? Because to a first century Jew at that time, to hear the word or the number 77, that would be like infinite times to us today. So if somebody said, how many times should I forgive my brother and sister? And someone said, you got to forgive them unconditionally for infinity. Jesus, shocking, shocking his love. And he believed that we all should extend unlimited forgiveness. And so what we learn from this passage is that forgiveness is an intentional decision to not hold a grudge against another person, despite what they've done to you or how many times they do it. Now, I want to be careful here. I want to make sure we understand that this is not in conditions where there's something of legal matters or abuse. We don't turn a blind eye. We don't turn away from that. We acknowledge it, and we let the authorities deal with it. Amen, church? What we're talking about is in a normal relationship with another person, when somebody wrongs us, that we realize that forgiveness is a choice. It's an intentional decision that we have to make. And it's a hard decision, isn't it? And I love this quote. There's a, a Dr. Uh, Karen Schwartz. She's a psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And she said this about forgiveness. She said, it is an active process in which you make a conscious decision to let go of negative feelings, whether the person deserves it or not. And I love that. So it's an active process, means it's ongoing, and it's a conscious decision to let go whether the person deserves it or not. So what she's saying, it's really hard. It's really complex. But in the end, it's best for us. She's also done a lot of studies. Uh, medical, their findings are amazing. She's found that just one simple act of forgiveness can help lower cholesterol, lower your blood pressure, lower stress, lower anxiety, lower depression, and lower your risk of heart attack. Like there's physiological benefits when we forgive. It's almost like our creator, Jesus Christ, knew that. And so when he tells us to forgive... There's a spiritual aspect, but there's also some physical and physiological benefits as well. And I believe also that God desires that we experience the freedom to correct with grace and truth and forgive without constraint. Without constraint. Luke 17 verses 3 and 4 says this, So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent... Forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Now, who's talking here? This is Jesus. This is Jesus again talking to his disciples. And so what Jesus is saying, if someone wrongs us, you've got to do our part, your part. And what's our part according to Jesus' words here? To rebuke and forgive. And we don't use that word rebuke a lot, do we? But last week, Pastor Kevin talked about this. It's called speaking the truth in love. It's going to the person, not going to somebody else, but going to the person who's hurt you and letting them know that they hurt you and how you feel. That's the rebuke part. And the second part is what? Jesus says we've got to forgive. We're called to forgive. So we rebuke and forgive. That's our part. What about the repentance side? That's their part. That's Jesus makes that clear. And so what's interesting is some people might read that and they would say, oh, well, what do we do with the person who never repents? We don't have to forgive them. And that's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is clearly stating that 
He's not giving us a reason to not forgive or be less forgiving. We know from Jesus' words all throughout the Gospels, Jesus calls us to a higher level of forgiveness, not narrowing forgiveness. And some of you today, I know, I don't, can't even imagine what has transpired in your life or how you've been hurt. And some out there might say, Pastor Sean, you have no idea how this person or that person has hurt me. And I would say you're absolutely right. I have no idea. But I do know that Jesus does. Jesus knows your hurt and he knows your pain. And Jesus still calls us to what? Forgive, to forgive. Because he knows what's ultimately best for us. And so what we learn about forgiveness, it's a deliberate act. It's a deliberate act of love and mercy and grace. I think about my own life. I think about some dear friends that Amy and I had when we were young lieutenant. I was a young lieutenant in the army. And my friend was also a lieutenant in the army. And we had great relationship, great friendship. Our families were very close, very tight. And within about a year after we built that friendship, everything was going great, we heard from a third party that there had been some words that had been said about us by my friend and his spouse about myself and Amy. And I don't know about you, if you've ever had words spoken against you from people that are your close friends, oh, it cuts deep. It's like that image that I have of picking up those pieces of General Custer. Those words cut deep. And it deeply hurt us. And I'd love to be able to stand up here today and say, and I did what the Bible said. I went to him and told him how wrong they were and how they hurt us. But I didn't. I didn't. It was like pride. And I didn't go to him. I didn't rebuke him. I didn't give him the opportunity to speak. I didn't even give him a chance. All I did was I just discounted him. And my wife and I both, our relationship was changed with them. And so they ended up moving away. We ended up moving away. And our relationship had been severed. Our friendships damaged. And that's what the challenge of forgiveness. And when we don't follow God's word, we've got to go and rebuke and forgive. And we allow them to repent. And I think the third freedom is this, that God's desire is that we would experience the freedom to forgive as we have been forgiven. And I love that in the video, young Mr. Steelman said this. He said, we forgive others because Jesus forgave us. I'm like, wow, that is exactly right, young man. You nailed it. Because we all know as followers of Jesus, the greatest freedom that we can ever experience in our life is surrendering our life to Jesus and receiving his forgiveness. His forgiveness, his blood flowed down, covering our sin the greatest freedom. And then in and out of that reality then, as his followers, we are called to do what? To forgive as Jesus forgave. And just as it is today for us and the church, forgiveness was really hard for the early church as well. And I'm reminded of that when I read in Colossians 3, this is the apostle Paul writing a letter to the church at Colossae. He writes in Colossians 3 verse 13, Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. And then he says these words, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, I also apparently Ephesus had a problem as well because we read in Ephesians 4, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you you. So what's Paul's point here? Paul's point is the gold standard for forgiveness is what? Is that we would forgive as Christ forgave us, as God forgave us. And how did he forgive us? He forgave us without merit, nothing we did to earn that forgiveness, and with mercy, love, grace, and amazing mercy for us. And that's the level 
of forgiveness that we're called to. The love of Jesus. And so what we realize is forgiveness, it's not only hard work, but it's truly heart work, isn't it? It really is. And I think for, fortunately in my story and uh, Amy and I, our relationship with that family, it didn't end. Because a couple of years later, Amy and I, we were now stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. We were going to a church in Clarksville, Tennessee. And we were at a worship service one morning and the pastor was preaching a message on unforgiveness and the damage that that does to our relationships, but also to ourselves. And he, at the end of the service, he gave us an opportunity to respond. And he said, is there anyone in your life that you've not forgiven or is there anyone in your life that you need forgiveness from? And I'm sitting there and the Holy Spirit began to work, <laughs> as you know. And in my heart, the Lord just put on my heart, you never forgave your friend and his family. And you need to do that today. And so after the service was over that day, I went and called my buddy many years, two years later. And I told him what I'd done and what I'd felt. And he had no idea what had been done. He had no idea that the things that had been said. Now he acknowledged that there were a couple of things that they maybe took out of context and applied to our family, applied to me, applied to my wife. But he had no idea. And when I brought it to his attention, guess what he said? I am so sorry. Sean, will you forgive me? I'm like, why didn't I do that two years ago? <laughs> But God brought healing. He brought restoration to our relationship. It's a beautiful picture that God's vision is that forgiveness, that it would freely flow within our relationships. This idea that we have the freedom to offer forgiveness when somebody harms us or hurts us, but also we have the freedom to ask for forgiveness when we harm or hurt or sin against someone else. And as you know, church, any meaningful relationship you have, you're going to have to do both of those. And sometimes it's on a daily basis, isn't it? Because the closer the relationship, the deeper the need for forgiveness across all our relationships, but especially those cr close relationships. So what is it that holds us back then? So what holds us back from this vision, this freedom that we can experience? Well, I think that there are really three unhealthy practices that can plague our lives, or sometimes we kind of find ourselves preferring these practices. And these practices are like an incubator. They feed and they breed unforgiveness in our heart. The first one of these is forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. And I'm not talking about like when you go out in the garage and you're like, what? why did I come out here again? I'm talking about spiritual forgetfulness. What we're talking about here is it's not remembering the hope and freedom we enjoy as a child of God because of Jesus' forgiveness of our sins. We have to remember and remind ourselves of Jesus on the cross. Just before Jesus said, it is finished and gave up his life. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them. And who's the them that Jesus is talking about? He's talking about those folks there that day, but he's also talking about what? Us, each and every human being. And Jesus extended that forgiveness to us. And I think so often in our hurt and in our pain, we have like short-term memory. And we need to be reminded to never forget, to always remember what Jesus did on the cross. Amen? Amen. I think the second one is this, is farsightedness. Now, farsightedness, we know, it's actually a vision condition, which you can see distant objects really clearly. But when it comes to up close, it's blurry. And so what we're talking about here is spiritual farsightedness. And that is when we magnify the sin of another against us while minimizing our sinful words, actions, and attitudes. This is when Jesus was talking to his disciples about this idea of don't look at the speck in your brother's eye when you got a plank in your own eye. Isn't it easy? Like we can look at someone else's sin and we can see it so clearly, but we don't see our part. 
in that, okay? That's that farsightedness. And then also, I think the third condition is this, is hard-heartedness, hard-heartedness. It's hard for me to even say. It's a stubborn refusal to take God and his word seriously and apply it to our life. And ultimately, I think hard-heartedness is rooted in pride. You think about hard-heartedness in the Bible, we remember Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh? When Moses went to Pharaoh on God's behalf, he said, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no, I will not let your people go. And what was it that caused Pharaoh to not let the people go? He hardened his heart. And it took nine plagues before he actually let go, let the people go. And so hard-heartedness can also be one because what hard-heartedness is kind of like what I went through with my friend. I was quick to discount God's word and quick to discount that relationship. And that's what hard-heartedness can do in our lives. And so I want you just to think about those three preferred practices. Is there one of those that you kind of find yourself kind of naturally gravitating towards? Just think about that for a second. And as you do, as you think about that, can you see how each one of these can lead and feed and breed unforgiveness and really damage our relationships? And that's what's important as we think about these. But praise Jesus, there's a way forward, isn't there? There is a way forward to hope and healing and wholeness in our lives. And we think about that, we, we can't control others, can we? We can only control ourselves. We control our part. And so we have to think about that, our part. What's our part as we think about these relationships and the importance of forgiveness? I think number one is this. We freely forgive because you are forgiven. You freely forgive because you are forgiven. It's what we heard from that young man in the video. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have experienced the greatest forgiveness of all time, of all history. And that is the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And that allows us then in that freedom than to express forgiveness in every relationship. And for some of you who are here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, you're watching online and you've joined us here on campus somewhere, our hope and prayer for you is that one day that you also will give your life to Jesus. You'll come to the cross, you'll confess your sin, and you'll give your life to Jesus Christ, experience his forgiveness, and out of that forgiveness, every relationship that you have will be better. Because Jesus is at the center of your life. And he is at the center of every one of those relationships. And I think we also can find wholeness and healing as we freely forgive because he's faithful. I mean, think about that. Just today alone, how has God been faithful to you? I think about the fact this morning that I was able to walk up these stairs when a month ago, I had to walk up those stairs and use the railing. No, I'm not getting cocky, but I'm just so thankful that God has been faithful and showed me his healing. I'm experiencing that. So how about your own life? How has God been so faithful to you just even this morning? He is faithful. And so what we can do is that we can trust God because he knows our pain. He knows our hurt. Now, what's important there is, I said, we can trust God, not the person. Because what we know is that forgiveness oftentimes comes with a heavy price in that someone has hurt us, and so we're asked to forgive them, but the trust has been breached. And so we have to separate the two. And I was talking with Pastor Dennis about this the other day, and Dennis reminded me that forgiveness of the person and trust in the person are not the same. They're quite separate. And he went on to say, without remorse, repentance, and convincing evidence of new behavior, you have every right to not trust that person. Yet forgiveness must be offered. You see the difference? So forgiveness is not necessarily about trusting because there's been a breach in the trust. 
But we have to remember our trust is in God. We trust in God to do the work in their heart. And so forgiveness, we can forgive because he's faithful. And third, we can freely forgive because we are all flawed and we all fall short, aren't we? We are all flawed and we all fall short. I mean, even as a follower of Jesus, times when that happened. But in that, then, we can be reminded that we are going to say things, we're going to do things, and we're going to maybe not do some things we should do where we're going to need to reach out and ask for forgiveness. So we can remember that when someone else hurts us, we can go, oh, yeah, I've made that mistake before, and I can extend forgiveness because of the freedom that God offers the freedom that that brings. And that's the last point. We can freely forgive because it brings freedom. It's the freedom that I experienced in my relationship with my buddy, our family's experience. To this day, if we called them up and said, hey, we're coming to town tomorrow, they would say, well, come stay with us. And it would be like we just pick up right where we left off. The freedom that that brought in our relationship, the freedom it will bring in your relationships when there is the freedom to make a mistake and to ask for forgiveness. And the freedom when they make a mistake or they sin against us, you can ask for forgiveness. You can grant forgiveness. You see that freedom. And I love this quote from a pastor and author. His name's Lewis Smedes. He said this, when you release the wrongdoer from the wrong, you cut a malignant tumor out of your inner life. You set a prisoner free, but you discover that the real prisoner was yourself. The real prisoner was yourself. And so as we release the anger and the resentment and the bitterness and we grant forgiveness, God gives us freedom. There is a sense of a burden lifted off of us, the beauty of that. And so I think about your relationships, my relationships. How might forgiveness in your life, how might forgiveness change each of those relationships for the better? For you and the other person. So I'm gonna invite Ricky up and Ricky's gonna come up and Ricky's gonna lead us in a song of reflection. And just as God did for me, oh, many years ago, in the quiet time of reflecting. We're gonna give you that opportunity this morning. You can just remain seated where you're at here on campus or we're watching online and just allow these words, these lyrics to fill your heart and just allow God then to move in your heart. And I want you to reflect on just two questions, two simple but life-changing questions. Is there anyone in your life you need to forgive? And is there anyone that you need to ask for forgiveness? Two questions. So we're going to give you the opportunity to quietly reflect on those two questions. And we're going to do that as we come to the foot of the cross. And so, Lord Jesus, we give you this moment in time for you to do your work in our hearts. And so, Jesus, as we think about your cross, where your blood poured out and poured down, and the forgiveness that you gave each one of us, and that you made a way for each one of us. So, Jesus, in that, we come to the foot of the cross, and we invite you to do a fresh work in our hearts. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. I come for life, I come for peace, I come before you on my knees. Lord, hear my cry, you're all I need, oh God, I come to the cross. 
Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that we can come into your presence and that Jesus, you love us and you want what is ultimately best for us. And so Jesus, we thank you for the heart work that you've just done. And Jesus, I'm so thankful as well that just as we can declare hallelujah, love has won, your victory over sin and death and the enemy, that Jesus, we can also declare hallelujah, love has won when we extend forgiveness as you have forgiven us. And so Jesus, we invite you to help us each take the necessary steps to forgive, to seek reconciliation, whatever it might be. But Jesus, we thank you that you love us enough that you call us into these relationships with people from all walks of life. And we thank you, Jesus, for the work that you've done and you will continue to do in each one of our relationships if we allow you to be the center. And we thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, we have just a couple of announcements as we close this morning. So this morning, as we always do, we'll have our prayer teams ready and up front. And they would love to have you come up front and just share with them maybe what you're walking through, maybe the need for forgiveness, whatever that might be. And this morning, our prayer teams actually have with them, they have these little half sheets of paper that are steps in forgiveness just some simple steps that you could take either to reach out to ask for forgiveness or to reach out to somebody 
to ask them to forgive you and for you to offer forgiveness for them. And so it's just some simple steps. And if the prayer teams will be up front, they would love to pray with you. If you are online, we want to encourage you to pray. You can send your prayers in on there as well. Also, if you are new this morning, we are so thankful that you've joined us for this day and what an honor and privilege it is. It would be our honor and privilege if you would go by the Connection Center on your way out and just let them know you're new today. And if you are online today, why don't you go ahead and text the word welcome to the number on your screen. They would love to just say a greeting with you. They to pray with you and also help you get connected. And for our military community, this is our active duty military, those who are retired military, we want to invite you today, we do about once a quarter, we'll do a military connection. And that's going to be upstairs in the garden room. It's out this doors up here, but around the sides and up there, the garden room. Just would be a great time for you, if you're in the military or military background, just to connect with other military families and just be blessed by that fellowship that you can have. So we want to invite you to join them upstairs in the garden room. And so if you will do me the honor and privilege, if you are able, would you stand and receive these words of blessing? So go in the grace and the power and the mercy of the one who shed his blood so that we could be forgiven. The one who loves you enough that calls you into relationship with him and into relationship with others as you freely grant forgiveness. Amen? Amen. Go in his peace and his grace. God bless you. There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's bone